Okay, can we start? Um, just a suggestion. Um, people who are sitting next to the speakers, please uh, turn off your mobile phones because there is no reception here and the phones are going very strongly. And we believe it might be causing this sort of nasty beeping in the speakers. So if you could do that, that would be very nice of you. Um, and with that, I'll uh, start my presentation, uh, which is uh, introduction into JTAG. Uh, how many of you actually used JTAG before? Nice. So I expect a lot of questions and maybe even comments to the talk which I have now. Uh, quickly about me, I work as a contractor. I work on uh, U-Boot Linux, Open and Beat It, uh, and I do FPGA as a hobby. Uh, but without further ado, let's go to the talk. Uh, I decided to structure the talk in the following way. Uh, first of all, a little bit of history, where JTAG came from, and what it is at all. Um, then we will talk about the JTAG hardware, uh, the protocol, and once we have all these low-level details uh, out of the way, then we will talk about boundary scan testing, which is how you test your hardware uh, over the JTAG, and then we'll talk about um, debugging software. And then we'll wrap it up and move on to the next talk. So what is JTAG? Uh, it's an abbreviation for a joint uh, test action group which tells you literally nothing, hence a little bit of a motivation. In the 80s, at the beginning, when you take like some sort of old computer or whatever from that era, you will see that the chips are basically uh, they have all the pins coming out of them and you can see the pins, you can attach a test probe to those pins and when you look at those PCBs you will see like these little pads all over the place. Uh, these pads, they are test points and they are used for uh, what's called a bed of nails testing. So at that point when you needed to test a PCB you created this sort of a harness which looked like a toaster and there was a lot of little needles in there. Uh, which connected to these test points. So when you manufactured the PCB, you put this into this toaster, closed it, and ran your tests, and this did all kinds of connectivity tests, whether all these test points are connected where they are supposed to be connected, and on the other hand, whether these test points are uh, not connected where they are not supposed to be connected. That way you verified that the PCB is okay and everything is great. You can ship it to a customer, and the customer will be happy because his product will work. Okay. However, at the end of the 80s, uh, um, the integration was kind of becoming more and more complex, the chips were becoming more and more complex, they needed more pads, and eventually uh, quad flat pack uh, packages didn't even cut it anymore, so uh, the chip vendors had to come up with something else. And that something else was uh, what's called a BGA, and all kinds of mutation of that. That is a ball grid array, I believe. And the thing is, instead of putting any sort of pins on the chip, they put pads at the bottom of the chip. And the way to solder it is you put some sort of a flux at the, at the bottom, then put the chip onto the PCB and heat it up. And all these pads at the bottom of the chip bundle with the PCB. That means you have some pads which are not accessible with any sort of probe. Uh, but this, this poses another problem. How do you test such a PCB if you cannot access those pads anymore? Well, the solution is really simple. Because the integration was getting um, more and more complex, you could also put more and more transistors into those chips, and therefore uh, the hardware people had the idea that they would put uh, some sort of a testing element on each of the pins, and then basically integrate this sort of test logic into the chip itself. And this is where the, the JTAG testing came out of and where, where this all uh, started. Now, eventually, since this was kind of useful, it grew support for debugging uh, software as well. Um, and we'll talk about that later. But that's, that's the gist of it. Now, the electrical interface is very much uh, electrical design from the 80s, so it's super simple. It's just a bunch of shift registers. Um, this is how the, the JTAG chain looks like. Uh, you have a 
couple of uh, optional signals, which is uh, test logic reset, the T reset, and then S reset, which is a system reset that actually resets the entire system connected to the JTAC test. Now, uh, I'm speaking about devices here, which are on the, on the JTAC chain, but it is also possible that these so-called devices, which in fact are called a TAP, uh, test access port, are within a single chip. So there could be multiple of these JTAC taps in a single chip, that's also possible. Or you can have multiple chips linked into this sort of daisy chain, that's also okay. Now if you dig into the uh, JTAC tap a little bit more, this is how it looks on the inside. So there are a couple of these shift registers here. And in fact, there is one instruction register and then there is a data register file in the tab. Um, and then there is a JTAC uh, tab controller which contains the actual state machine. Now the tab controller is controlled through uh, two signals that the test mode select, which allows you to navigate the state machine. And the test clock, which by pulsing that, you move around the state machine, depending on what's the value of the TMS. And then there is the TDI TDO, which is uh, the test data in, test data out, and between that you have the, the registers connected. Now, this tab controller orchestrates the behavior of this, these register files. That means you can move this tab controller state machine into such a state that you can shift in a different instruction into the instruction register, or you can connect the data, one of the data registers in the data register file between the TDI and the TDO, and then shift data through. So that's how it behaves. Um, the instruction register allows you to pick uh, which of the data registers will be effective and or how the JTAC tab should actually behave. The protocol is completely serial. Uh, you use TMS and PCK to move around the state machine and you use TDI, TDO and PCK to shift data through these different registers in the register file that is either the instruction register or the one of the data registers. Now the state machine looks like this. Uh, I know the picture is absolutely not pretty. Uh, I built it using ticks and I'm not a ticks expert, so I apologize for that. I'm sure you can find better pictures on the internet. However, that's the whole thing. That's what's in the tap controller. And when you power up your machine, uh, you will end up in this state, test logic reset. So that's where the JTAC state machine always starts. And then depending on what you, on what you set on the TMS and pulls the TCK, you can navigate through the state, through the different states of this state machine. Now there are three stable states in here. One of them is uh, shift DR. Uh, that one is used for shifting in data into one of these data registers. The other is, uh, Shift IR, which is used for shifting data into the instruction register and then effectively selecting instruction and the behavior of, of this whole JTAG uh, tab. And the last stable state is uh, the test logic reset. The trick is, uh, and why the T reset is optional, is because if you hold the TMS uh, in logical one for six clocks of the TCK, then you will always reach the uh, test logic reset state from any of the states of this JTAC state machine. So that's why the reset is for the test logic is kind of optional. You can just hold the TMS high and then just clock through the state machine and, and you will get to the beginning. All right. Now, um, speaking of instructions, what can you put into the instruction register? Well. This stuff is not really standardized per se. Um, however, each and every single chip vendor releases what's called a BSDL file. A boundary scan uh, definition language, I believe is, is what it is. And that BSDL file describes all the instructions which that specific JTAC tab in that chip supports. Uh, it describes the length of the instruction register because that instruction register can have arbitrary length, it's, it's just hardware. It could be seven bits, it could be 
25 bits, if they need that many instructions, it's really up to the vendor. Um, it also specifies uh, yeah, which instructions are supported. There are a couple of common ones, ID code, for example. That one allows you to shift out um, the 32-bit ID of the vendor and the chip, but some chips do not implement it because uh, they want to keep the transistor count as low as possible, so it, it might not just be there. Uh, the other one is bypass instruction. Now, that one is important because if you have multiple devices on the JDAC chain and you want to communicate with a specific one, then you put all the other devices into bypass and only select that, uh, uh, only select that specific one and communicate with that specific one by shifting uh, one bit into each of the bypass registers and between that you shift whatever you want to put into the device which you want to talk to. So there is that. Um, oh yeah, the BSDL file is, is kind of roughly VHDL-ish looking, so it's, it's kind of derived from ADA. Now, here's an example of uh, shifting ID code into the instruction register and then reading out the ID code. However, uh, it's probably better if I show this to you on the JTAC state machine. So there we go. If you want to read the ID of your chip through JTAC, this is what you do. So you power the whole thing up. Uh, you end up in the test logic reset here. And the first thing you do is you shift in the ID code instruction into the ID code register. So you use TMS and TCK and navigate the state machine through here all the way until capture IR. Now the thing is, when you are in capture IR, you pull the TMS uh, low and then start shifting the ID code instruction uh, value through the TDI. And at that point, the state machine will drop into the shift IR stable state and the data will be loaded into the instruction register. Right. Once you're done with that, you pull um, TMS high and then go through uh, exit one IR and update IR states back into run test idle, which is there. And that way you latched in the ID code instruction into the instruction register. Now, once you are done with this, you go through the same process uh, for reading the data out. That means you go into the capture DR state. That would be here, okay? And you start shifting in, for example, zeros, because you do not care what you shift in into the data register. The ID code data register just ignores whatever is coming in just need to push the data out of that register. And that's why you get into the capture DR, then you pull the TMS low, you get into the shift IR and start capturing the TDO data. And once you do it uh, 32 times, then you get the ID code on the TDO as the complete one. And that's your ID on the TDO. But uh, to clean stuff up, you continue from the shift IR through the exit IR update DR and back into the run test idle. So that's how you get the ID code out of it. And it seems my thingy here is not really working. Okay, um, does that make sense? And are there any intermediate questions about this? Yes. Say again? Oh yeah, sure. Of course you do. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, just, just a quick question. Um, how do you know what to clock it at so that you make sure you get the data and rather clocking out before it's there? So the question is, uh, how do I know how to clock it? How yeah, quickly what frequency? You yeah, what frequency? Do you okay, so the question is about the JTAC frequency. Um, this, again, depends on your PCB design, on the hardware design, on the chip design. There are a great many factors which influence that and you basically take the lowest possible value of all these uh, the hardware people will tell you what the frequency, what the maximum frequency is. Now, there are tricks like uh, return T clock, which is another special signal on some chips, which allow you to synchronize the signals, especially the TDO uh, data signal coming out of the chip. 
however, this is not present on all the other, uh, on all the chips in general. It could be, it may not be. Um, the safe bet is roughly around a couple of megahertz. Uh, with contemporary chips, you can go up to 20, some of them go up to 200. It really uh, depends on the design. Okay, thanks. Yeah, sure. Okay, so let's move on to boundary scan testing, which is literally the primary design um, option behind JTAG. Uh, the hardware people needed to test hardware, right? So they kind of designed the JTAG in a way that allows them to do that. And the design is, is like super simple. The idea was to put some sort of small boundary test, uh, scan testing cell between uh, the chip itself and the physical pins of the chip and they connected these cells into a very, very long chip register, like hundreds, maybe thousands of bits. And uh, this is called the boundary scan testing register. You can use specific JTAG uh, instructions, which then allow you to operate on this register. And each of these cells allow you to control uh, behavior of the pin. So you can kind of disconnect the pin from the chip itself and then either drive the pin to a specific uh, <coughs> logical level, maybe even uh, voltage level, depending on how complex that cell actually is, and or you can sample the value of the pin. Here is an example uh, boundary scan testing cell, which uh, you can see in, in some SOCs or uh, FPGAs. That really depends. Uh, and how does that work? Well. On this left side here is what is actually coming out of the silicon of the chip. And you see there is a, an input signal. Now that's for sampling the value of the physical pin. So when boundary scan testing is disabled, the uh, input goes through this particular MOOCs directly and to the SOC input. Same applies for the outpad. If boundary scan testing is disabled, if you want to drive the physical pin, then you turn the output enable, which goes through this mux, opens this, this whatever it is, and the output is going through this mux, it passes through whatever it is, uh, and goes to the physical pin. I really don't know the name of that component, I'm sorry about that. Uh, Tri-state buffer, yes, thank you. Um, Right. However, if you enable the boundary scan testing, then you can shift in um, the uh, boundary scan testing register through from the TDI. It goes through these flip-flops here into the TDO, so it kind of passes through this boundary scan testing cell. And each of these boundary scan testing cells has like a small entry on this boundary scan testing register. And then the data are stored in, in these flip-flops, however, they do not take effect just yet. You just shifted the data in, they are in those flip-flops, but nothing changed just yet. Now, if you execute an explicit update, then uh, the data from these flip-flops are moved into this, these three flip-flops, and they actually control what's coming out into these buffers, right? Um, so, uh, when you then enable the boundary scan testing, these MOOCs change and the output from these flip-flops is then driven either on these pins or if you want to use the boundary scan testing for sampling the pin value, then um, you can do that even without disabling the, uh, even without enabling the boundary scan testing because it's sampled into this flip-flop, and then when you shift data through, then, then ca they come out of the TDO, the, the sampled input data. But this is quite complex, and uh, if you want to look into this into a bit more detail, I suggest you study this schematic a little bit more. Um, but it eventually becomes kind of clear how, how this works and how we can disconnect uh, the pin from the SOC and drive it through the boundary scan testing and uh, how we can sample the input data from a pin this way. Now, 
the JTAG has three instructions for this whole boundary scan testing thing. Uh, the first one is sample. So that one just says uh, shift out the entire boundary scan register out of the TDO. When you do that, you can sample the, the entire register and, and figure out what the value is, including the uh, values of each and every single pin which has this boundary scan testing cell on your chip. The other instruction is preload, and that's literally the opposite. It allows you to shift in a new version of this boundary scan testing register values, possibly modified whatever way you need it, into the boundary scan testing register. Uh, however, even if you do the preload, nothing changed yet. It's just somewhere there in that register, but it does not have any impact on the behavior of the pins. It's only when you run this last instruction, which is xtest, which actually shifts uh, the preloaded data from, from these flip-flops into these flip-flops when the whole thing actually takes effect and it, it enables the boundary scan testing in this case. Uh, the other thing is, since you have to run the X test to explicitly confirm that yes, you want to use the current value of the boundary scan testing register to uh, do the boundary scan testing and to, for it to take effect, um, the sample and preload instructions usually, usually are the same thing because if preload doesn't take immediate effect, you can just you know, shift in zeros and sample what's coming out of TDO, and this will be the value which you sampled, and or you can shift in data and ignore what's coming out of TDO, and this will be your preload. So it becomes kind of one instruction. Now, um, we had a LED demo implemented. However, I, I cannot show it to you because I don't have the hardware here, but this is basically the gist of it. The way it worked is that you shifted a sample instruction into the instruction register, just like I showed you before, um, and collected what came out of the data register, which was the boundary scan testing register current value. Then we did modification to the specific boundary scan testing cell uh, to output the value of the LED, which we wanted, on a specific pin of the chip. And then we used preload to shift in the modified version of the boundary scan testing register. Now, once we had all this ready, we used the X-Test instruction to execute the test on the chip, and indeed the LED was illuminated. So it was roughly a three-bit change to the entire boundary scan testing chain, which we had to do to flick a pin. That's how it works. Um, any questions regarding this? No, okay. So we continue to debugging software. This is the last section. Um, this is actually something which grew on the JTAG a little bit later. It was not there originally. And because of that, a lot of vendors actually implement their own uh, um, implementation of, of uh, debug tabs. However, um, each and every CPU debug tab usually provides you like basic debugging primitive status. Something to stop the CPU, uh, possibly to implement breakpoints. Uh, to start the CPU, to modify the CPU registers in some way. And if you have that and possibly instruction stuffing, which means putting instructions into the CPU's execution pipeline, which for example, low-end MIPS does, uh, then you can do memory access with all that through the CPU, which is super slow. That's why some vendors have like optimized memory access tabs, uh, which has uh, another issue because then the CPU might see the memory through caches and the memory access tab sees it directly. So you have to manage caches at that point. Um, what else is there? Yeah, memory access is free fried, yeah. So that's basically all you need to, to debug uh, your CPU and there is also usually something to determine the state of the CPU uh, that is uh, to figure out whether it's running or, or stopped. Now, there are different tools to access the JTAG bus um, the cheapest one are, are like FT223, scratch that, FT232R, which are like super cheap and I wouldn't recommend them unless you are really on budget uh, because with these devices you end up uh, sending one USB transfer per each toggle of the bits on, on that FT232R, 
which is not super efficient. The JTAG is just painfully slow. Uh, however, there is a better product from uh, FTDI, the FT2232H, which has an MPSSE engine, which allows you to accelerate JTAG by just kind of bundling how uh, the pins of that chip should toggle. And the adapters are like 80 euros or something along those lines. It's definitely worth it. Um, then there are professional adapters which are much more expensive, BDI, Speedy, uh, Lauterbach tools, and many others. <coughs> I'm not sure if these are um, very useful for basic debugging. However, they do provide uh, exceptional value when you need something very special. So maybe that's an option. Um, as for the software, specifically free software, there are two options. Uh, one of them is uh, URJTAG, uh, which is more of a honorary mention now. And the other is uh, OpenOCD. <coughs> uh, so as for the URJTAG, uh, it's actually a spiritual successor of, of a very, very old project from the early 2000s, which is the OpenBinC JTAG. Um, and this one was mostly used to flash uh, old PDAs, uh, that was devices based on uh, strong arms from DEC and the next Intel, and or Intel PXA, maybe Samsung, uh, very old Samsung SOCs. Uh, it supports flashing CFI flashes, it supports flashing, uh, yeah, memory mapped CFI flashes. Unfortunately, it does not support modern debug devices and modern JTAG adapters. It also doesn't support the modern SOCs. So that's, that's kind of unfortunate, and the activity is uh, sort of low. However, it does support importing BSDL files directly, so you might be able to use that for convenient boundary scan testing, which is nice. However, uh, the go-to tool nowadays is most likely OpenOCD. Um, this one supports all the modern SOCs. It supports modern uh, JTAG uh, debug adapters. It supports uh, flashing CFI NOR flashes as well as uh, SPI flashes. And uh, it is scriptable in TCL, which uh, some of you might like, some of you might not like. Uh, it's probably a matter of taste. Um, it has a convenient Telnet interface, which allows you to do like basic debugging, stop the CPU, run the CPU, read, write memory, manage caches, that sort of stuff. And it also provides GDB interface, uh, which is really convenient if you need to do some sort of more in-depth debugging. And uh, boundary scan testing with that is possible. And actually, Alexey Rimpel from Pengutronic has some sort of script to do that. And he spoke about that at uh, Embedded Linux Conference 2018, I believe. So I would suggest you watch his presentation as well. Um, now let's take a look at OpenOCD and how to use that. Um, so to get started with OpenOCD, just install the OpenOCD package in your distribution. That's probably good enough. Uh, then get the, some sort of a JTAG adapter, preferably the FTDI one with the 2232H, connect it to your device which you want to debug, um, power, connect it to the PC, power on the device, and then launch OpenOCD in the following way, which uh, probably is unfortunately unreadable, but the slides will be available, so that's, that's okay, you can read them. Um, the idea is that, that you just like start open OCD, right? Uh, the S option is a search path for TCL scripts. The TCL scripts describe uh, your debug interface, um, the board which is being tested, the SOC which is being tested. So in this case, uh, I'm just setting the search path to TCL, and then I'm picking two files. One is with the one describing my uh, debug adapter here, which is Flyswatter 2 uh, from Tin Can Tools. And the other file is describing the board which I'm debugging, which is a completely custom one here. And the OpenOCD will start. It will print some sort of a debug information. But what we can see is that Telnet interface is available on port 4444, and also clock speed is uh, 20 megahertz because this is a very fast port. Uh, and there are two GDB interfaces. Now, why two? Because this chip has actually two CPUs in it. One of them is some sort of PRU unit. It's, it's basically BeagleBone. So one of them is a PRU unit, 
the other is Cortex A8, I believe. All right, and that's it. I can connect to these interfaces. Uh, first of all, Telnet interface. Uh, so I can just use Telnet to connect to localhost 4444. It prints OpenOCD and then gives me the OpenOCD monitor interface. And there I can halt the execution, I can single step, I can read write memory, um, I can upload and download files, which is convenient if you need to like upload a chunk of memory or download a chunk of memory. Um, oh yeah, here's an example of, of the uh, Telnet interface. If I halt the CPU, I get some sort of information about what the CPU state is. So in this case, it's in thump state running from program counter here, which is in the SRAM of that chip. Caches are disabled data cache uh, and enabled instruction cache. All right, um, I can also dump memory. In this case, I'm dumping the beginning of the SRAM where the USPL is residing. So here, uh, I dump the memory and I see that there are four 32-bit values. Now, if I object dump the U-boot SPL itself, I see that uh, at the beginning of the U-boot SPL there are exactly the same values. Oh. Here, perfect. The memory matches what's in the binary, that's great. Uh, I can also single step. As you can see, the program counter is incrementing. Yeah. Here and here, perfect. However, this is still kind of through the debug interface. I mean, you see the, the values and the hex values kind of everywhere, and this is not very intuitive. So there is another option. There is a GDB interface. Um, and to make use of that, all you need to do is uh, either install GDB MultiArc, which is available on, on pretty much every modern distribution, or install GDB for your uh, architecture, which you want to debug. And then all you have to do is run the GDB, provide the binary with debug symbols, which you want to debug, and connect to the open OCD. Uh, this is done using the target remote localhost and port command. So uh, here, that way. I'll scroll down a little so it's visible. When I do that, um, I see that uh, the chip is actually running in the U-boot SPL, and I see where it is. So uh, OpenOCD parses the debug information, determines, scratch that, GDB parses the debug information, OpenOCD provides the, inform the information where the CPU is, and GDB matches it and tells me that this is actually in the code here. And what we can see from that is, is that basically the U-boot SPL is loading something from the end. Um, even if you are in GDB, you can access the, the kind of the Telnet monitor interface uh, using the monitor command. Uh, so in GDB, if you type like monitor and something, that stuff goes into the Telnet interface. Uh, in this case, I do monitor version, and it would be the same as if I type version into the Telnet interface. It prints the open OCD version. Uh, you can use that, for example, for resetting the system, like monitor, reset, halt, and or you can use it for writing flashes like monitor, flash, something, something. So that's what this is useful for. Now, uh, final thing I want to show you is how to debug U-boot using OpenOCD and GDB. Because this is something people were asking about and uh, the documentation exists, but it's uh, apparently not very easy to find. Well, the thing with U-boot is that when it is running, somewhere in the middle of the boot sequence of it, it relocates the U-boot binary at the end of the RAM. Um, the problem with that is it confuses GDB because suddenly the symbols, which were at some fixed location in the RAM, are moved. And the trick is to determine the relocation address and then use add symbol file GDB command to specify that the symbols actually moved. Now, to determine the relocation address of U-boot, which is calculated at runtime, you have two options, either you just let the U-boot start and then use the bdinfo command and read out the reload gather noted down. So like this, or you use the GDB itself and use architecture specific trick to extract that uh, relocation address out of the U-boot structures. Now the trick is that 
you would hold some sort of CPU register, which points to a structure called the global data. And these global data contain the relocation address. On ARM, this is, on ARM32, that is uh, register R9. If you just cast that register R9 to the global data uh, structure pointer and read out the relocation address using GDB, uh, which would be this here, and GDB tells you the relocation address is this value here, which is surprisingly same as this one. Because literally when you run the video info, it prints exactly GD2 relocator. And then you use the add symbol file. So here is an example of using the add symbol file. I'm adding symbol file for uBoot, which has been relocated to this address, which I extracted, what happened? Uh, which I extracted from either here or here. And then, then GDB asks whether this is okay to add such a symbol file. You confirm that yes. And when you do that, you can use uh, GDB again as, as usual. For example, if I run backtrace here, uh, I can determine that uh, the uBoot is now executing, relocated to that, that specific address here in uh, Console test C, so you would is basically waiting for user input in the shell. Uh, that's it. Now, uh, to wrap it up somehow, um, what should I say? JTAG is super useful. Use it for debugging. It's, it's really convenient. It's a it's helpful tool. However, um, the debugging software, especially the free software, could still be a little rough around the edges. Um, those tools definitely could use uh, some sort of patches and some sort of uh, input from the community to improve them. That's all. Thank you very much. <laughs> and uh, questions? Yes. Uh, there's a break. <laughs> Thank you. Sweet. Hi, uh, how does OpenOSB learn about the length of each in instruction register of each tab? Right, so uh, OpenOCD doesn't know. Uh, you have to explicitly describe that to OpenOCD based on what's in the BSDL file for that specific chip. So I have to write a TCL script too? It is described in those TCL scripts, <laughs> yes. That's right. Um, any more questions? Then if there are no more questions, uh, actually, if you, if you come up with something, you can just talk to me. That's, that's just fine whenever I'm in the hallway. Just interrupt someone and just interrupt me, whatever. It's OK. There is a question there. Just throw it. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Marek. So just a couple of simple questions. Sorry, maybe I missed it. Uh, you use mon halt command. Why not to use the standard GDB commands to stop? Say again? Like, uh, you use mon halt command in GDB console. Uh, right. Why not to use, like, SI or... I believe the halt yeah. command would work as well. Yeah, yeah, but what's the point of selection in this mon halt for you? So Because I commonly use the right, right the regular GDB commands when I de debug the, the session over the open OCD. So it was a bit surprising for me. I have never seen that. <laughs> uh, well, this is kind of embarrassing, but I just copied it from one of the debug sessions. So uh, I just kind of typed it in and didn't really think about it. Okay. I don't have an answer for you. And yes, GDB held would probably work as well. Yeah. And one, one more question. Um, can you briefly describe this current state or your opinion about the current state of the open OCD support of SMP? and how to debug the multiple execution. Okay, so the question is about debugging SMP yes, cores. Yes, in GDB session for multiple cores at the same time, yeah. Well, OpenOCD will export you uh, for each core a GDB um, interface. So you can connect to each core separately. I'm not sure whether you can do cross debugging. I never tried that. However, at least modern ARM cores have all kinds of special facility for this cross-triggering and all that sort of stuff. And I never tried that. But 
I would not be surprised if that was actually supported. We would have to take a look into the open OCD. And oh, it's a good idea to join the IRC for open OCD and ask there because there are people who are active and who are looking into it and they would be able to help you out. Thanks.